you can imagine, it's not too bad to walk through right now, but yeah. when you get to July and this stuff is all this. <laughs> yep. And it's, you know, 97 degrees out here. Oh boy. I like it, but. You gotta love it, I think. <laughs> so one of the kind of interesting things we've stumbled on from some, actually a child's book that I had uh, when I was a kid growing up was that if you play beaver sounds on a speaker, they'll damn it up. So I was bored one time and took an old Bluetooth speaker, stuck it out in the landscape with a loop of, I think it was like stream songs to study to or something along those lines. Came back the next day and it was covered in sticks and mud. Like they had been trying to damn this sound of this running brook that I had played for them. <laughs> this is oh, it's fun to me. Yeah, this is good stuff. Okay. So we've got kind of a prototypical beaver incision or beaver canal beginning right here. Uh, beavers will use this to access both the water resource and the resources on land that they utilize, especially the wood. So if we kind of look to the, the right here, we're going to pick up a lot of these willow trees that have been carved off by the beavers and then drug back down into those channels. Over time, as they exhaust the resources directly adjacent to the stream, they'll start to bring this channel further and further out, not only reconnecting the water with the land, but also allowing them quicker access to bring those resources back to their home. So really, they're connect creating these highways throughout the floodplain for their own benefit to be able to transit the landscape. Watch your hole there but it'll also allow for a lot of the nutrient processing that we're trying to encourage to, to take place. Oh, look at this, a little pile of wood chips. So beavers are not eating the wood itself. A lot of times you'll see these kind of fields of chips. They're actually eating the cambium or the vasculature, the, the blood vessels, if you will, of the tree on the outside. The, the wood in the middle is mostly dead. Uh, they don't re receive many nutrients from that. So they're really just eating that exterior surface and then leaving behind readily biodegradable material. It's very similar to what we would use uh, in a bioreactor, for instance, to process nitrates. Uh, beavers are doing it for free for us. Oh, I was wondering how that, uh, see, they shaved it all until it fell over. I've actually found a cottonwood with a beaver inside where the tree smashed him. <laughs> he didn't get out fast enough. That was pretty wild. I'd consider this sort of a seasonally, uh, temporarily readjusted dam, if you will. So you see a lot of the water moving over the top of the dam. May not be providing a lot of the structure that we hope, but really the beavers just have, need time to repair. As you see the water drop in the summertime, they're gonna work uh, every night to rebuild what, what was lost during the spring. And even though we lost, you know, appreciable portions of some of these dams, they're still retaining sediment behind them. They're still modifying the flow of the channel. Uh, you see a lot of wildlife utilizing the, the adjacent landscape and then the pool itself. And you'll also see looking at the dam, it's not just made of wood. It's made of grasses, sedges, horsetails, all kinds of things compacted with sediment. And then they'll actually roll stones up and place them on the top to kind of anchor everything in place. They've been doing this for millions of years. They have a good idea of how to retain water, especially in these pretty flashy hydrology landscapes that we deal with in Iowa. So, so that's what the dams are trapping, is this kind of phosphorus-rich, highly organic material. So not only are the dams modifying the flow of the channel, they're trapping substantial amounts of this high organic content, high phosphorus content sediment. Trapping it not only in the dam itself, the structure that they're building, every night they're excavating their pool and placing this along the floodplain. When the dams leave or they break, the beavers abandon them, there's still a legacy of all that sediment up in the floodplain that the natural processes can take advantage of. So even though their legacy might leave a given stretch, they might move their dam to another location, we're still reaping some of the benefits from a kind of human use standpoint. So immediately after a flood, we're already seeing evidence of critters coming in, a lot of shorebirds. Uh, we've seen some pretty neat mammals moving in through this system, muskrats, we've got an otter out here. 
A lot of times when you hear beavers discussed in Iowa, we're told that they don't use lodges. Well, when beavers are allowed to interact with the floodplain appropriately in areas like Cat and Branch that we're at today, they will start to build lodges. Uh, lodges are just a place that they can maintain some comfort, maintain some security from predators, but also allows them readily access to the stream channel itself. In a traditional Iowa channelized stream corridor, beavers don't have access to the floodplain to make structures like this, so they'll burrow into the banks themselves. A lot of times you'll see those 12 inch circles bored into the bank of an agricultural stream. It's probably a beaver living in there or a muskrat family. Areas like this, we've got three or four of these lodges throughout this system that they've been either abandoned or they'll use uh, periodically during the summer, uh, over winter down further south from here. But it's really neat to see when we allow the beavers to interact with the appropriate landscape, they return back to their normal state. We also see pretty significant trapping of sediment behind beaver dams. Here's a perfect example of a floodplain deep 12, 13 inches of this highly effluent, very rich alluvial material that's deposited behind these dams on a daily basis. Uh, some of the dams here at Catton Branch we estimate to contain between three and 5,000 pounds of this very rich, very mobile sediment. If this wasn't retained by the Beaver Dam, it's very likely moving downstream very quickly into the Des Moines River and eventually down into the Mississippi Delta. This is gonna be very rich in phosphorus, phosphorus being the limiting uh, nutrient for those algal growths and blooms that we're worried about throughout the summer months. Really, we're just trying to strike a balance between what the beavers do in the landscape, how they can contribute to some reduction of what we do in the landscape, and how we can cooperate with them. Like how does a normal person now just say, isn't that just mud? Right. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah, that's a good question. So you, I call it like the marshmallow fluff. It's like the very, it's light. It adheres to itself, whereas if we look at, you know, just kind of a s traditional soil that's engaging with plants, we get, we start to create some structure. So the hope is, after these are deposited here by the beavers, plants will move in, reestablish themselves in those areas, utilize those nutrients, store them in their biomass, and hopefully they get returned to the environment and just stay within the cycle here rather than going downstream. Anytime you, yeah, they, they, every night they dig this out and they put it along these edges here. So they're, they're constantly removing that material, placing it into their dam structure, integrating it in with all the woody debris, the grasses and things to allow it to stay in place. You can start to separate that sandy bed material from that recently deposited, you can see little strips. So that was probably one flood event, subsequent flood event. It lets us kind of look at how these things are deposited over time. These processes happen on 10,000 year scales, 1,000 year scales, 100 day scales, all the way down to every minute this is changing. Sediments moving, being transported and relocated somewhere else. All the biogeochemical action that's happening in this really interesting areas is, is pretty, pretty immense. It's very intense for the amount of uh, river segment that they occupy. There's a lot going on. Whereas, you know, a mile upstream, it's just a dead straight, fairly homogenous, not very exciting channel. You get down here and it's, it gets pretty, pretty interesting. Cool. And that's really what drives a lot of the biodiversity, right? Is all these niches that can be occupied by all these critters are provided here. So look at this, this is what I was talking about. If you just kind of get down and think, all of those were big willow trees at one point, right? All of these were willow trees that are now regrowing, kind of resetting the landscape. So this is probably a couple years old, and then they regrew, they were re-chewed this year. So it's really thinning and allowing other things to take, take hold here. So the kind of neat thing in my mind is as these dams get abandoned or get incorporated into the floodplain itself, the beavers are gonna to have to move seeking out new woody debris, leaving this area to regrow into some new state, uh, beaver meadow, if you will. 
So what we traditionally consider a beaver meadow kind of complex of the, the great American West, you've probably, uh, the stereotypical dam you've seen growing up, is beginning to happen in places in Iowa again, which a lot of people didn't think was ever gonna be the case. I mean, they were trapped essentially into non-existence not that long ago. Every, everything uses this. But yeah, like right over, was another channel over there that they just were like, nope, we're just gonna move it redirected the entire stream. So the channel used to be over this way. Well, they've eaten all the trees, right? right? So as the trees are exhausted, the beavers are gonna cut those kind of side incision canals. It's gonna allow them access to trees over here. Once those are exhausted, they're gonna reconnect to a new area, re-begin the cycle, if you will. Uh, they need three, four years for some of these willow trees to regenerate so they get enough biomass so they can take advantage of them. But willow trees being the type of tree that they are will regenerate very quickly so it provides a good balance and maybe it's something that uh, land managers can take advantage of planting willows adjacent to the things that they really want to preserve yeah they'll take advantage of downed wood like this during the winter time especially you might have a snow bank here that was relatively high giving them access to chew the the lower part of these recently felled trees and again we're making pretty cool wood chips you don't have to dig very far to see a lot of the biological processes beginning to reunite them with the, the landscape. Oh, this is it's all new. Wow. So you can see, you can see uh, these are all beaver tracks. They almost look just confused, right? Because there's this giant storm event in the spring and it totally just throws them out of their whack. So they have to kind of reestablish where everything is. A lot of times they mark their territory with these kind of mounds of castor oil, feces, you name it. They're little scent mounds. They'll get washed away during these flood events and they'll kind of lose track of their, their place in the landscape. Oh yeah. Hmm. So as the beavers exhaust their preferred food sources, they'll actually go to these kind of lesser food sources, larger trees before they venture too far over land. Uh, they're very unwieldy on the land. If you've ever seen a beaver walk, it's not very graceful. They prefer to stay in the water. They will avoid some of the you know, cedars, pines, things that are either highly uh, acidic or, or have some sort of natural defense mechanism, poplar being another. That being said, if they get hungry enough, they're gonna start gnawing at anything that's got nutrients in it, especially in the winter time. Watch your footing here. They'll create those little, oh. Those are sandhill cranes. Yeah. That's a super rare bird for Iowa at least. Hell yeah. Very cool. So a lot of these backwater areas that are created by beavers from these canals as they start to incise them really provides, in my opinion, the area for most of the processing to happen. Water that makes its way into here is gonna be here for quite a bit of time. Water in the channel might be moving through in seconds, whereas water here might be days, even weeks. All of those microbial and plant processes that are removing all the stuff that we're trying to get out of the environment happens in places like this, where the residence time or the time that the water moves through is much slower, so all of those processes have time to interact with them. It also traps a lot of organic matter, which is a key component, carbon, for that process. Uh, it also provides areas of relatively deep water that begin to become low oxygen conditions, again, driving all of that nitrogen removal. We also have an interesting cross-section of the dam over here where we can see it's not simply a bunch of sticks placed in the stream. It's an intentional design. It has supports like an engineer might place in a real human dam. Uh, it also is interwoven with various grasses and things taken from the environment to really provide it that, that solid structure. It, they aren't very porous. Water doesn't move through the dam very well. It'll go over the top or around in some cases, but when the dam is fully constructed, it's, it's pretty well watertight. So anytime you have a beaver dam, you inevitably have muskrats. They leave evidence in the form of a small kind of cylindrical scat. We've also got a lot of shorebird activity. We've got some feces, we've got tracks from probably lesser yellow legs, plovers, sandpipers, all kinds of really exciting birds in the state of Iowa. Muskrats are essentially an opportunist in a beaver dam. 
they recognize, hey, this beautiful structure's here, this nice pool. They also move through the landscape and the water significantly better than the land. They don't have the tools, the teeth, the skills to build a dam, so they just take advantage of, as the beavers move out, they become renters, if you will. Uh, we find a lot of the beaver complexes made up of most, multiple dams will have kind of a residence, a primary residence dam, and then these accessory dams simply either providing access to additional woody material, future building sites. Uh, so the, the beavers become the landlords of the stream, muskrats become the tenants, along with all the other birds and fish and amphibians utilizing that space as well. Yeah, this is wild. On the banks, you'll see any of these uh, standing willows where you see the grass bound to those willows, that's the high water line of the most recent storm event. So it gives you some context that this water was well above the dam in this case. So that's why we had some, some dam uh, removal happen here, if you will. That being said, I'm willing to bet if we come back when the water's back down to base flow levels, this will be rebuilt pretty quickly, maybe a day or two. So this water right now is still coming off the landscape from the recent rains. We're gonna get a bunch more rain this coming winter, or this coming weekend rather, that'll keep it up. But I'd say by late May, this will be, all this will be flooded again. Because actually the dam continues all along here. See this? All the way. This is still dam. So this is all, at one point, over the winter, they had that all backed up. So as beavers are flooding areas that previously were not wet, uh, trees like shagbark hickory, things that are a little bit less uh, okay being in uh, wet feet will tend to die out. You get a lot of replacement with things like willows, cottonwoods, maples. So really the beavers are not only directly influencing the vegetation kind of restructure, if you will, by chewing down trees, they're also contributing to mortality and regeneration in other ways, just by modulating things like the water table, uh, the period of time that areas are wet. Uh, really, they're, they're indirectly influencing the environment just as much as they are directly, if not more. They'll get me first. <laughs> They're mostly out at night. We're at one of the primary study dams here at Cat and Branch. If I was to take a couple steps back, I'd be in a good six to eight feet of water. The primary function of these dams is to provide water for the beavers to move in and out of. Not only that, but this provides a huge amount of habitat. We're looking at an acre of water being held behind this relatively small dam. Uh, these beavers are changing the landscape pretty significantly in areas like this. This dam itself survived multiple winters. Uh, it survived storm floods of seven, eight inches of precipitation in a day or so. It's a very resilient dam. You'd look into the floodplains on either side and you see willows as far as the eye can see. There's not a single standing hardwood tree. They've totally changed the makeup both vegetation-wise, animals, everything is manipulated in this area by the beavers. That's a cool spot. Whew. Make sure everything's dry. Yeah. Right? It's like the difference between that. And, it's pretty impressive. How much water is behind there? And then in the summertime, it'll just kind of like, you sit in here and it's got 40, 50 degree water flowing through and it's a nice place to just exist. So we pulled some sticks out of the most recent beaver dam we visited. You can see a lot of the chew marks from where they're eating that vascular cambium on the outside of the sticks. For whatever reason though, beavers in this uh, reach here compared to our other sites tend to leave, I call it like a little handle almost, makes for a nice walking stick, but also you can see where they've gripped on with their teeth as they're dragging these things through the landscape. So I don't know if it's small adaptation that they've learned uh, and then passed down among each other, but we find these sticks with this kind of ancillary handle all over this landscape. Everywhere else they would shear this clean to the end, but for some reason they're leaving that here. Wild little critters. I know, right? <laughs> That's so cool.